Um, next, I'd like to welcome Jenny Gilchrist. So um, Jenny is a nurse practitioner in breast oncology at Macquarie University Hospital, one of only four breast cancer specialist nurse practitioners in Australia. She also works for the McGrath Foundation as the chief clinical lead for the metastatic McGrath breast can cancer nurses. Her clinical interests and passions include the care of people with breast cancer, supportive care, and the prevention of burnout in healthcare professionals, which we can all uh, relate to, <laughs> certainly in the healthcare sector. Um, I just want to acknowledge myself that Jenny's dedication um, to her work goes over and above, so I'd like to welcome her and thank her for her contribution to our forum today. Thanks, Jen. I did tell her not to read out my bio, <laughs> which she just blatantly ignored, but anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, taking control. See, I don't have the light issue that Ben's got because I'm like <laughs> a lot shorter. Um, so I guess I'm not a, I'm a realist. I am a, I tend to be a positive person, but I'm not sort of, yay, positivity, that's going to get you through because that's a bit of bullshit sometimes. Um, so I do want to talk to you though about empowering yourself. That's, that's what I wanted to talk to, to you to, today about. <coughs> Plus, I'm also going to do a bit of myth busting at the end. Um, some of my biggest bugbears um, are some of, some of the garbage that's basically out there that is just not based on any evidence. So I'm just going to go through some of those questions that we commonly get asked. Um, there's a lot of pictures in this um, slide deck, and I guess I do think that people through their cancer experience, and I hate the word journey, as most cancer nurses do, I do think that people become better versions of themselves through it, regardless of if you're early or metastatic. Even if it's just that you stop for a second and have a look at what's around you and you look at um, the people who are important to you and you learn not to sweat the small things and ignore the shitty people in your life and think, look, I'm not going to actually invest my energy um, to those people anymore and you're focused more on the important things. And I do think these situations do build resilience. I know you don't necessarily feel like it all the time, but you know I think all, everyone who goes through this experience is incredibly resilient and tough. And I don't really like the word brave either, but you know I do particularly admire you all. And I do this job all day, every day. I've done it for a long time and I genuinely mean it because I don't know how half of you do it, to be honest. I haven't been through it. and. You know, I can support you all, but I think, you know, if I was in your shoes, I'd be an absolute mess a lot of the time. But anyway, so the word I came up with, I made up a mnemonic, and the word is power. <coughs> um, that does look like a Buddha with a Superman cope, co uh, cape. I'm not really sure why, but anyway. So I guess the first letter, letter P, you might think is positivity. Um, it's not positivity, it's actually persistence. And I guess it is more about not giving up hope. Um, don't ever give up hope for a cure. I know at the moment that breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer is not curable, but you don't know what is around the corner. We've just heard a talk from Ben about all of these treatments, that half of which didn't exist five years ago. People are living a lot longer now with breast cancer and living really, really well. Um, you know, that's not the case for 100% of people, but, you know, nothing is 100% guaranteed. But I think certainly the majority of people are living a hell of a lot longer than they did five, ten years ago and living really, really well. And look, the other thing too is, you know, talking about hope for a cure, you know, perhaps we need to reframe the way that we think about the word cure. You know, potentially in this setting, can it mean living well with disease? Does it mean, does it need to mean that you've got rid of the disease completely? It's the same with the word remission. You know, people sometimes interpret that as being completely free of disease, but does it actually need to be? Does it mean that you're living well with the disease? I guess the other aspect of persistence is that you can actually do it. Yes, you're all gonna have tough days and I get that. And you're gonna have days where you wanna wear your Udi and eat a bucket of ice cream. And I think that's the best thing to do on those days but you can do it and you are doing it and you have been doing it. So just remember that always. I'm also not a motivational speaker, so this is very hard for me to be this kind of motivational. 
Of course, there's the word positive, and like I said, I'm not going to stand here and sit there and say, be positive, that's going to get you through this, okay? I'm not going to say be negative either, but the point is, is that, you know, we have to be real, and you're all in this situation, and it's crap. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good or bad or how early or advanced your disease is, having cancer is a shitty situation, and I wish none of you had to go through it. But I do want you to try and focus on something positive in each day. So in those days where you feel like crap, you know, and everything just seems to be getting on top of you, even if it's just the fact that you, that it's not raining outside, or even it's the fact that, you know, you can look at your little kids or you've got your dog that's not judging you or saying shitty things to you or, you know, anything. It doesn't really, it doesn't, just something little can be, like I said, that it's sunny. Um, try and surround yourself with positive people. I'm not saying that, you know, everybody needs to be like, yay team, but just focus on those people. There are people out there who are very pessimistic and they, they don't mean to be pessimistic. They've, they've genuinely got a positive intent for doing things. People don't mean to say shitty things to you. It just comes out that way. And I guess the thing is, is that if you can try and surround your people with people that, you know, sort of, I guess, support you as best as they can, that is often a better situation than surrounding yourself with people who are just Debbie Downers all the time. Take ownership of your illness. You guys are in the driver's seat. You've got to remember that. You know, at the end of the day, you come and see us in our clinics and we talk to you and we say, OK, this is what we recommend. But this is your life. You're, you're going through it. We're not going through it. But, you know, so you need to remember to, you know, you're in control here. If you've got questions, try not to be afraid to ask the questions. I know the doctors are busy, I know the nurses are busy, but you know, take that time. We are here to support you. And you know, often the doctors are running late because you know, they have been caught up with someone who needs more attention at that time and then next visit they won't need that attention. So you do get your turn. If you're unwell, do something about it. You know, if, if call someone, whether it's a GP or tell your partner, you know, just tell someone so that someone can help you through it. Um, you know, often people don't want to bother the nurses. I get that all the time. I'll say, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you ask me what you could do? And they said, oh, I didn't want to bother you, you're busy. And I said, yeah, but my job is to be here to support you. That is why I'm busy. And not everybody needs us all at the same time. It all waxes and wanes. I think one of the hardest things that people go through with cancer is that a lot of it's out of your control. People like to control their situation. Um, I'm a control freak. I like to control lots of diff different things around me. But in this situation, it is very hard to control a lot of things. And I think a lot of people feel very out of control. I think Carrie said before about, um, I guess, controlling, not controlling your emotions, but you can control your reaction. So an example is I am one of the most reactive people you will ever meet. Someone sends me a shitty email or something and I'm like, straight away, right? And I shouldn't do that. And every appraisal I have comes up, says, no, Jen's too reactive. And I say, I'll try not to be reactive, but hey, I've been like this forever. So it is what it is. But the point is, is that exactly like Carrie said before, if you have those negative thoughts and you're starting to get in that spiral, acknowledge that thought, but park it. You know, you don't need to invest time in it. Go, yep, okay, that's there, but I'm actually not gonna focus on that at the moment. That's the things that you can control. It's your life at the end of the day. Don't let someone else do, um, control what you do. And just remember this, these are your decisions. So if you don't agree with it, just ask someone or say something. And I know that that's hard, but just try and, and remember that, you know, you are in the driver's seat. W is for willing. Be willing to accept help. Be willing to ask for help. I tested this talk on a group of patients yesterday um, they were predominantly early breast cancer patients, but I said, hey, listen, this is something I've come up with and I need you to tell me if you have any strong reactions to anything I'm saying. And I said about willing to accept help. And they said, look, you've also got to say willing to ask for help. Accepting help or asking for help is not a sign of weakness. And I think some people feel that it is, but I actually think it's a, a sign of strength that you can admit that you can't actually do everything yourself. 
There's nothing wrong with that. No one, no one can do everything themselves. These are a little bit less motivational. It's exercise. You're going to have a session this afternoon by an exercise physiologist, but exercise is good for everything. Um, it helps lessen the side effects that people experience. It's really good for your mental health to get some time out. Um, it's good for physical health, obviously. We know that it can, you know, decrease estrogen levels when you have less fat, all of these sorts of things. So there are multiple benefits to doing exercise. You don't need to do truckloads of exercise. You don't need to be a marathon runner. You don't need to be at the gym, you know, eight hours a day. There are resources available, and I guess the, there was a position statement put out by the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia a few years ago. It's a bit hard to read there, but basically what it says is about 150 minutes of moderate intensity um, or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week um, and three, sort of two to three resistance training sessions. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you don't stick to that. Um, you know, I usually just say to the patients, try and go for a half an hour walk at least three times a week. If you can do it five days a week, great. If you can do it seven, then happy days. Um, but just doing anything, find something that you like to do, yoga, whatever you want to do. It doesn't need to be anything, like I said, you don't need to run a marathon. R stands for being real and being resourceful. So always just be yourself, okay? I know that's hard sometimes. People, I, I, find, it, I find it fascinating because, you know, people come into the clinic and for a lot of people that's their big outing. They haven't really been out of the house and they come and see, particularly through COVID, you know, they came and seen us and saw us in the clinics and they got all dressed up and it, people get into a routine very often is that they'll come and see the doctor, they'll go and have lunch and they might go for a shop or whatever and... I just think, you know, be real and be yourself all the time. You know, we, ne we want to get to know you as you are, not, you know, not as this sort of picture-perfect presentation that you might put on for the oncologist. A lot of the time we can tell when people are not actually OK, despite them sitting in the room and saying, yeah, I'm fine and I don't have any pain, and then they go to get up and they're like... And you're like, you know, just be honest. And try and advocate for yourself. Again, like I said, you know, you guys are in the driver's seat. I know it's hard to do that sometimes, but try and support yourself with a team that is going to listen to what you need and what you want. Um, be resourceful. So I guess I found this, and excuse the spelt, the typo. It was really annoying and I can't fix it because obviously it was a, an involvement. There should be an E there. But again, it's about utilising the people around you. So the multidisciplinary team, the nurses, the doctors, physios, social worker, clinical psychologist, if you've got them. I realise that not everybody has got access to everything, um, but usually, you know, there can be some workarounds. I, so it's tips is the mnemonic. Uh, I is involvement, be involved in your decision making. Know what your treatment plan is. So you know, just be aware of what you're on um, and who to contact if you have issues. Um, I don't know how many of you met the metastatic nurse down here. Um, she was a state-based nurse, so covered sort of all of Tassie, Paula. Uh, unfortunately, she has resigned. However, um, hopefully, she did tell me that she did get in contact with as many people as she could to inform them about who to contact if they have problems. You can always contact the rooms, go to emergency, see your GP, call your nurse. Um, but, you know, don't just ring and hang up, leave a message. You know, I always tell my patients, leave a message because I'm usually with people who are on the phone or doing something, so I don't necessarily pick up all the time, but I will always get back to you or just shoot a text message. Um, and utilise the support around you. So preferably, if you can, well, if you've got someone, bring someone to you with appointments because I think sometimes, regardless of whether you're getting good news or bad news, you don't necessarily hear all of it. And I know that every time I go to a specialist, you know, you sort of go and you've got your questions in your head and the doctor's like, yep, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden it's over and you're out of the room. So you've forgotten what you needed to ask in those five minutes. So sometimes it's good to have someone with you who can hear all of the words that are coming out, plus also remind you about things that you wanted to ask write them down. Um, you know, there is financial support available. You can call the Cancer Council. Um, 
I'm running out of time quickly already. Um, and also just talk to people around you. So these sorts of forums are great to get to know people that are actually going through exactly what you're going through. Um, and just a lot of people find talking helpful. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a kumbaya group kind of situation, but just even one on one. We've cut, we've done that bit now. Um, now, Mythbusters, this is a quick bit. Show of hands, cannabis cures cancer, yes. No. No. There's no evidence that medicinal cannabis cure, uh, cures cancer, but there is some evidence um, for supportive care and side effect management. So it's a little bit limited and it's very individualised, but there has been evidence to show that it can help improve anorexia, which is appetite because it gives you the munchies, nausea, it can help with sleep, pain, anxiety. I've got a patient at the moment who is on it and is very chilled and she just wants me to up and up and up her dose because she's very chilled. Um, but it's actually, it's, it's nice and refreshing um, and she's doing well. Palliative care is all about death and dying. Yes? No. No, no is the correct answer. Basically, palliative care is about supportive care. And if you look at the real definition of it, it is about care that's provided for someone who's got an active, progressive or advanced disease um, and who the primary goal is to optimise the quality of life. It is about helping people to live as well as possible, as long as possible. Um, in an ideal world, everyone would get an early referral to palliative care because we know that people live longer that are referred to palliative care services. They have better side effect management. Um, but you can't always have that situation. It depends on your resourcing and the way that the services are set up. So many people don't need palliative care at all if they don't have a lot of symptoms and they've got no major issues, whether they be social or psychological or uh, emotional, spiritual or physical. Um, but, you know, inevitably people do, and I use anything as an excuse. If you've got pain, even if it's relatively w well controlled, I like to try and refer to the palliative care team just so that you've got that introduction and you're building those relationships along the way. The other thing is that palliative care is not necessarily a, you know, a, a pointed referral. It can be dip in, so dip in and dip out. So you can get referred to the palliative care service, utilise them until your symptoms get under control, and then you can be discharged from the service, and then you can be re-referred in. It's the same with going to a palliative care unit. You don't necessarily go to a palliative care unit and not ever come out. A lot of people go in for a week, get their symptoms under control, might be may, uh, pain or nausea, and then they get everything under control and then they go back home again. I've already talked about this. Being referred to palliative care means I'm cactus. No, it doesn't. We know, like I said, people that have got early referral to palliative care have better outcomes. They've got much um, higher patient satisfaction and improved quality of life. Ben's a palliative care physician as well, so he can talk about that better than anybody. Um, complementary and alternative medicines are the same. Yes or no? I'm seeing a lot of shaking of heads. No, they're not. Alternative medicines are used instead of conventional medicine. Complementary medicines are used alongside conventional medicines. Examples of uh, complementary medicines um, and alternative medicines are acupuncture. Um, and I've just written there, there's some evidence to show that it helps with nausea, hot flushes, anxiety, fatigue, aromatherapy, so smelly things, candles, oils, whatever you like, that can help with sleep, anxiety, pain, depression. Um, herbal medicines, they're not necessarily a no-no. Um, and again, find that team that is not necessarily going to quash every single idea that you might have about you know, how you want to improve your health. I guess from a treating perspective, we just need to check some of the drug interactions because if we're giving you chemotherapy, for example, we don't want the herbal medicine to sort of counteract that. It just doesn't really make sense. Homeopathy, hypnotherapy, um, again, some evidence to show that it helps with nausea, anxiety, pain and hot flushes if you're up for it. Meditation, Reiki. Um, naturopathy. My favourite one, painkillers are addictive. Yes or no? Well, no, but yeah, yes, but no. So I guess 
most people in this setting, I'm not saying all, most people will be taking it because you've got pain. So you're actually taking it for a reason and when you have, are taking a drug for a reason, then it is not necessarily addictive. What people get addicted to is that pleasure that they get from the tablet. A lot of our metastatic patients don't necessarily get pleasure from the tablet or the high. They, are, you know, they tend to sometimes get shitty side effects and not want to take the tablets. But I guess you know, when you need to keep taking the tablets because you're getting that buzz and you don't want to withdraw from it, that is where it's an addictive thing. 99% of our patients are not taking it for that reason. It's a very complicated pathway there about addiction. Um, I was looking at it and I'm like, yes, I have a very addictive personality, so there's definitely something wrong with my wires there. Um, but fortunately, it's not opiates. Um, obesity increases cancer risk. Correct. Basically, particularly in the context with uh, oestrogen positive cancer, oestrogen is contained in fat cells. Um, but basically it, it sort of impacts on inf uh, inflammation, inflammation, sorry, and that is what ends up causing cancer. Sugar feeds cancer. No. Sugar in the form of glucose feeds cells in the body, including cancer cells, but it does not actually speed up the growth of cancer or cause cancer. Um, very often with some of these things that are out there, there are indirect links. So what happens is that if you consume more sugar, you tend to be more obese and therefore that is what is contributing to cancer risk as opposed to the sugar directly actually causing cancer. Eliminating all dietary sugar does more harm than good. Um, it can lead to malnutrition and muscle loss. And basically, I just want to say everything in moderation is okay, including, you know, sugars, including alcohol, um, you know, everything in moderation. I think someone said earlier, I think it was you at the back, talking about living your life. At the end of the day, I want all of our patients to live their lives. You've got one life to live. You guys know that more than anyone. And life's too short to just worry about what people think and not do what you want to... Have a drink if you want to have a drink. Don't drink a whole bottle of it. Well, you can if you want, just don't do it all the time. Everything in moderation. That's it. I was told to lift you guys up. I don't know if that was particularly <laughs> lifting, but anyway, I tried.